Hello there. Consider the following problem. Here I've just got some masses of mass m, and they're all connected by springs of spring constant k shown in the arrangement here. Right, and this is constrained just to move in the x direction, right? The spring, the masses aren't going to move up and down, they're just going to be, you know, oscillating to the left or to the right. So my goal here is I want to find the general solutions x1 and x2 of t, right? where these uh, refer to the block's displacements from their equilibrium position, which I've indicated here in blue, right? Equilibrium position just being the positions of the blocks where these springs are totally unstretched, right? And so the blocks would just be sitting here uh, at this equilibrium position. So from a bird's eye view to tackle this problem, what we're going to need to do, we need to find the forces on each block, right? That's going to generate two differential equations. We're then going to solve that system of differential equations, and then we're going to output the positions of the block, right? And we're going to get some general solution from that, okay? So how do we actually go about that? Well, first, we have to consider the forces on the blocks when they're displaced some arbitrary x1 and x2, okay? So let's go ahead and start by thinking about the forces on block one. All right, so the way that I'm going to indicate my displacements here is I'm going to go and I'm going to draw below this picture here, right? So for example, here I'm going to displace both of the blocks, right? And I'll have some displacement x1 and x2 here, just like this. And then I'll go ahead and fill in below, just like that. And you can see that this refers to me pushing block one to the right some amount x1 and block two to the right some amount x2. Now, I've been very, very intentional here. Whenever I have these types of dynamic problems, I always indicate a positive displacement. That way, if I have a positive displacement and I end up getting res uh, a resulting force to the left in the negative direction, I just immediately go, okay, the sign of my force is negative. If you don't quite understand what I mean by that, don't worry, I'm gonna be collecting a lot of force terms here and you'll see exactly what I mean. Now, if we move both blocks at the same time here, like I've indicated, well, it can be a little bit challenging because this middle spring here, you know, is not only being compressed by, you know, moving this, this first block to the right, at the same time it's being expanded because I've also moved this second block here to, to the right. So there's definitely some notion that, you know, these effects are going to in, in some way kind of cancel out with each other. But it's a little bit confusing on how exactly uh, that ends up working, you know, because we're basically changing two things at once. But I want to make this really, really easy. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine two different scenarios. First, I'm going to displace block one a little bit while holding block two uh, in place. I'm holding block two in place. So I have some displacement x1 here and block two just stays in place. And then next, I'm going to imagine holding block one in place and then displacing block two. And then it's going to displace some amount um, x2, okay? And then by analyzing the forces in each of these situations and then adding them together, we're going to get the total force for some arbitrary displacement x1 and x2. So let's go ahead and look at this top picture here. If I displace this first block, some amount x1, look at what it's doing. It's gonna stretch out this spring here to the left. And so this left spring here is gonna to wanna to pull my block back. And so it's gonna have some force. What's the magnitude of that force? K x1. The spring is just gonna follow Hooke's law. So far, so good. All right, next, this middle spring here, it got compressed. So what's it gonna to wanna to do to block one? It's gonna push block one to the left, right? It's gonna push outwards. So that's gonna to be to the left. So we're also going to get k x1 to the left from this second spring here, okay? So, so far, we have these two forces to the left. Let's go ahead and write those down on, on block one. So we have minus 2k x1. 
why is there a minus sign here? Remember, for a positive displacement to the right, I had a negative force to the left, right? There's this opposite relationship here. And again, this is why I always define my displacements to the right. So I can see when I have these negative forces pointing to the left, I can immediately write them as negative. If I made this displacement to the left instead of to the right, I would get positive forces and then I'd have to do just a little bit more mental gymnastics in my head, just a little bit more. But just to avoid that headache, you know, just make your displacements positive. All right, we've gone through and we've collected all the forces acting on block one in this top picture from the spring to the left and to the right of it. Perfect, that's all that we need. Next, in this bottom picture, right, I've gone and I've displaced this second block some amount x2. So what's that gonna do? That's gonna stretch out this middle spring, right? And so that middle spring is gonna wanna compress back together. So it's gonna pull this block here to the right. What's the magnitude of the force? Simply kx2, we just use Hooke's law again. Awesome, right? This first spring here is not stretched out at all, right? Because again, I left block one in its equilibrium position. All right, great. So now let's go ahead and just add in this last force here. And of course, a positive displacement of x2 is giving us, is giving us a positive force. So let's just write that down. So we have plus k x2. And of course, to fully put together our equation of motion, this is going to be equal to the mass of block 1m times its acceleration x1 double dot. Great. All right, now let's go and do the exact same thing for block two. And of course, this is gonna be really easy, just the exact same procedure. Okay, so this top picture here. Okay, the spring on the right here, we can see is not you know stretched out at all because I haven't moved block two at all. Great. Uh, so it's just the, uh, the middle spring here. It got compressed. So what's it gonna wanna do? It's gonna push block two over to the right. So I'm gonna get some force, a positive kx1, because a positive displacement of kx1 gave us a positive force. So I'm just gonna write down a positive kx1 here. Okay, great. And now we go ahead and we move on to our second picture here. This middle spring here, it expanded. What's it gonna wanna do? Okay, it's gonna wanna compress back together. So it's gonna pull my block, just like this. So we're gonna get some k x2. And now we look at the spring on the right here. And what's it gonna do? It's gonna push outward, right? Because we compressed it. So it's also going to push my block to the left and we're gonna get k x2. And so of course, positive displacement to the right and we get negative forces. So we're gonna have a minus two kx2 here. And of course, this is going to equal m x2 double dot, okay? All right, now really, we've done all of the physics. At this point, this purely becomes a math problem. We have some differential equations, we gotta solve them. All right, and I already made a video before talking about how to solve systems of uh, coupled linear differential equations, but I'm gonna go through the highlights still just so we're on the same page. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do here, I'll go ahead and move my mass m to the other side here. Okay, and I'm gonna be left with x1 double dot, x2 double dot. It's gonna be equal to, right? I'm gonna take my k out and everything. We're just gonna be really quick about this. We're gonna have k over m times minus two x1 plus x2. And then I'm also going to have k over m times x1 minus 2x2. Hopefully we feel awesome about that. And of course, now that we're here, we can now immediately see that if we define the vector x to be x1, x2, and we define the matrix A to be equal to, really it's k over m times minus two, one, one, minus two, just like this, then we can now rewrite this system of differential equations as x double dot is equal to a x, 
just like that. And just as a reminder, because I've been kind of hiding it, these x1 and x2, these are going to be functions of time ultimately, that's what we're trying to solve for, right? But yeah, this is awesome now that we're in this form here, because I already talked about in the last video that differential equations of this form, right, the solutions form a vector space, right? And so we need to find the basis of that vector space. And then if we have a basis, we can build up any solution uh, by creating a linear combination of those basis vectors, right? And so that motivates us to turn this into an eigenvector problem, where now these eigenvectors will act as our basis vectors. Um, because they're linearly independent if you have distinct eigenvalues. If that's a big mouthful, um, you know, again, watch the previous video I made uh, where I go through that carefully. All right, so I just reordered these equations real quick, just like in the last video to make our little roadmap, where first we evaluate this uh, eigenvector problem. That's only going to get us so far. And then we're going to return back to the differential nature of the problem. That's part two here. All right, so I've gone through here, I wrote out the results. If you just look at path one, this is just, again, it's just a carbon copy of what I did in the last video, right? We just use characteristic equation in order to get our eigenvalues. And then with those eigenvalues, we find the corresponding eigenvectors. Really easy, I just don't wanna spend a bunch of time doing it. But so when you go through the blue route, you almost get to the solution, but you're left with these unknown functions, which I'm just calling gamma of t and delta of t. And so in order to find those, we have to go and we have to return back to the differential nature of the problem. So let's go through the red route. So I'm going to have, I'm going to plug in my eigenvalue here for lambda. So I have minus 3k over m times my eigenvector. So let's plug that in minus 1, 1, gamma of t and this is going to be equal to i just plug this in here take the second time derivative and of course that's going to give us minus one one gamma double dot of t just like that we just take the second time derivative and then from here right we don't really care about what's the same between these we just care about what's unique about them so in other words i'm saying just pick out the minus 3k over m gamma of t equals gamma double dot of t. And now we're going to be left with a second order differential equation, right, in which we're going to very easily be able to solve for gamma of t. And of course, we know exactly what this differential equation is. This is the differential equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. So in other words, if I go through here and I go and I define this 3k over m here as some angular frequency omega 1 squared, then I'm ultimately going to get a solution, gamma of t, in the form a cosine omega 1 t plus phi, right? Where a is going to be my amplitude and phi is going to be some phase shift. And again, I'm going to call this a1 and phi1, right? Because we're going to end up getting a very similar result for, you know, for lambda2. And so now for lambda2, if we just go and we plug these in, uh, just like before, we're going to get a very similar looking differential equation. Delta double dot plus, now it's just k over m times delta. And this is all going to be equal to zero. We get this again just by plugging it in just like we did before. Great. So from here, we know that we can define this parameter here, k over m, as omega 2 squared. And if we do that, our solution delta of t is going to look like a2 times cosine omega 2, uh, omega 2 t plus phi 2. And so now all that we got to do is just plug these functions back in for gamma and for delta, and we're essentially done. So to bring this all together, remember our goal, we found our basis vectors b1 and b2, those were our eigenvectors, right? And so to write out any solution x, we need to take some linear combination of those basis vectors. Um, 
And so when we go and do that, there's a little bit of redundancy. We already had our general constants A1 and A2. So I'm just gonna use those in place of C1 and C2, right? You see what I'm doing there? But the point is now we just have some linear combination of these basis vectors. And so let's go ahead and just wrap this up by writing this out explicitly. We get x1 of t is going to be equal to minus a1 cosine omega 1 t plus phi 1 plus a2 cosine omega 2 t plus phi 2. And of course, x2 of t is going to be equal to a1 cosine omega 1 t plus phi 1 plus a2 cosine omega 2t plus phi 2. And of course we defined earlier that omega 1 was going to be equal to square root 3k over m and omega 2 is equal to square root k over m. So as a final note, and I've really been implying this by saying that we can write out our solution as a linear combination of basis vectors just like this. Let's just go ahead and uh, check out what happens. Let's say that our C1 term goes to zero, right? So we only have, you know, this basis vector B2 determining our solution. Well, in that case, right, that corresponds to A1 going to zero with my final answer, right? And so that, right, we would just have x1 equals a2 cos this stuff, and x2 equals a2 cos the exact same stuff. This is going to correspond to my blocks oscillating together, right? They're just going to be oscillating together. They have the exact same solution form, the exact same frequency, right? And so they're just going to, like, oscillate back and forth together, almost as if they're just one block. Right? And then likewise, let's go ahead and imagine what happens if my second term goes to zero. If instead these go to zero, then of course we're going to have the exact same solutions but with a minus sign between them. Right? We, we have these guys are looking exactly the same but with a minus sign. So in other words, these blocks are going to be oscillating completely out of phase to each other with the same frequency still but now they're just oscillating completely out of phase with each other, right? And so what we call these, we give these a special name, we call these the normal modes, the normal modes of our system's oscillation. And so the last thing that I want to recognize is that taking a linear combination of our basis vectors to get a solution plus C2, B2, just like this, is saying exactly the same thing as saying that we can construct our motion as some combination of normal modes, okay? So, so that's where I'm going to go ahead and end the video. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you end up getting the general solution for a uh, coupled oscillator system like this. This was a, a, a pretty simple example where all the spring constants were the same and the blocks had the same mass. Um, but yeah, I hope this was helpful. Thank you so, so much for watching.